My name is Dorothy, and I am 60 years old. I have always believed that life was something you could plan for. You make decisions, you build a future, and you live with the consequences. I never imagined, though, that one day, everything I thought was stable could unravel so completely. I live with my husband, Frank, who's two years younger than me. We've spent a lifetime together, building our home, our family, and our lives. But all of that started to fall apart last year, when we made a decision that should have brought us closer, but instead led to our undoing. It all began innocently enough. Our home, built by my father decades ago, had started to show signs of its age. The walls creaked, the paint chipped, and the roof leaked. It was a house full of memories, but it needed serious work if we were going to continue living there comfortably. So, Frank and I decided to renovate. The costs were high, and the monthly mortgage repayment of $1,800 weighed heavily on our minds. But I held a senior position at a leading company, and the bank was willing to approve the loan in my name. Frank, who managed a medium-sized restaurant, didn't earn as much as I did, so it made sense for me to take on the financial responsibility. As the renovations began, the house started to transform. What had once been a tired old structure was becoming a beautiful, modern home. I was excited about the changes, imagining the years Frank and I would spend here, enjoying our new surroundings. The smell of fresh paint and the sound of hammers and saws filled the air, and with each passing day, the house began to look more and more like a place where we could spend the rest of our lives. But even as the house took on new life, something else was changing. Something I couldn't see. It was subtle at first, a shift in the air that I couldn't quite place. I didn't realize it at the time, but those changes were the first signs of the storm that was about to hit. The first gust of that storm came in the form of a phone call from my son, Steve. He was 31 years old, a responsible and hardworking man who had never given me cause for concern. Mom, he said, I'm getting married. The news took me by surprise. Steve had always been so focused on his career that I hadn't expected him to settle down anytime soon. I was happy for him, of course, but I couldn't help feeling a little uneasy. Who was this woman he had chosen to spend his life with? The day I met Jenny, my unease deepened. She was polite, charming, and everything you would expect from a young woman about to join a new family. She had brown hair that framed her face in soft waves, and she wore a white chiffon dress that made her look almost angelic. She greeted Frank and me with a warm smile, showing off her perfect white teeth. I'm Jenny, she said, her voice sweet and clear. It's such an honor to meet you. There was something about her that made me uneasy, though I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Frank, on the other hand, seemed smitten. He smiled at her in a way I hadn't seen in years, and when she gripped his hand tightly, he didn't pull away. It was a small thing, a simple gesture of friendliness, but it struck me as odd. Jenny was just meeting us for the first time, and yet she acted as if she had known Frank for years. As the days passed, my discomfort grew. Frank and Jenny seemed to be spending more and more time together. Whenever I came home from work, I would find them talking, laughing, and sharing stories. Steve was often absent, busy with his job, and I began to wonder if he noticed how close his wife was getting to his father. I wanted to say something, to voice my concerns but I couldn't find the right words. How do you accuse someone of being too friendly? One evening, I came home to find the living room filled with the smell of alcohol. Empty cans and bottles littered the table, and there, in the middle of it all, were Frank and Jenny, deep in conversation. Mother, welcome back, Jenny said, her words slurring slightly. She was clearly drunk, and the sight of her in that state in my home made my stomach turn. I couldn't understand why she was there, drinking with Frank without Steve. When I asked about it, Jenny explained that she had been feeling lonely because Steve was working late. Frank had invited her over to keep her company. It seemed innocent enough, but the sight of Frank stroking her hair, comforting her like she was a child, made my skin crawl. Something was wrong, very wrong, but I didn't know how to confront it. Things took a darker turn when Steve came home and joined them. He had driven, yet there he was, drinking as if he didn't have a care in the world. 
When I offered to drive them home, Steve refused, saying they would stay over. The whole situation felt off, as if I were watching a play, where the actors had forgotten their lines. I didn't understand why they were staying, why Steve was acting so out of character, and why Jenny seemed to be pulling all the strings. The next morning, Jenny apologized profusely for her behavior, claiming that she had just been too drunk to think clearly. Frank, too, seemed regretful, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something had shifted in our home. Something dark and unwelcome. I wanted to believe that it was just my imagination. That I was overreacting, but the unease in my chest refused to go away. And then came the moment that shattered everything. Frank sat me down one evening, his expression serious. Dorothy, he began, we need to talk. My heart sank. There was something in his voice that told me whatever he was about to say would change our lives forever. When Steve and Jenny arrived, I could see the tension in the room. They didn't greet me. They barely looked at me. And then Frank dropped the bombshell. This house will be given to Jenny, he said, his voice flat. If you disagree, we'll get a divorce. For a moment, I couldn't breathe. The words hung in the air like a noose around my neck. What? I finally managed to say my voice barely a whisper. You've been making Jenny suffer, Frank continued, his tone accusatory. She's been crying, saying she can't go home because of you. That's why I've decided to give her the house. It's the least we can do after what you've put her through. I was stunned, unable to comprehend what I was hearing. Jenny, who had always been so sweet and polite, was now accusing me of making her suffer? And Frank, my husband, was siding with her? I had done nothing wrong. Nothing. Yet here they were, turning my world upside down with their lies. Steve, too, had been deceived. He stood there, anger in his eyes, accusing me of being a terrible mother. How could you do this to Jenny? he shouted. You've always been so controlling, so overbearing. I can't believe you would treat her this way. The more I tried to defend myself the angrier they became. Jenny cried, playing the victim, and Frank and Steve both fell for it. I was outnumbered, outmatched, and overwhelmed. They wanted me out of the house. My house, the one my father had built, the one I had lived in all my life. They wanted to take everything from me, and I didn't understand why. Desperate to make sense of the situation, I began to notice things I had overlooked before. A strand of brown hair on my pillow. Jenny's, not mine. Whispers between Frank and Jenny late at night when they thought I was asleep. Little things that, when put together, painted a picture I didn't want to see. But the truth was undeniable. Jenny and Frank were having an affair. They had been conspiring behind my back, using Steve as a pawn in their twisted game. The realization was like a knife to the heart. Everything I had known, everything I had believed in, was a lie. My husband, the man I had trusted with my life, was betraying me with my daughter-in-law. I knew I couldn't stay silent any longer. I hired a private detective to gather evidence, to prove what I already knew. The photos, the recordings, all of it confirmed my worst fears. Frank and Jenny were plotting to take the house from me, to push me out of my own life so they could live together without anyone standing in their way. Armed with the evidence, I decided to confront them. I waited until the house transfer was complete, until they thought they had won, and then I struck. When I walked into my former home, Frank's face turned pale. What are you doing here? he demanded, trying to sound confident but failing. I have something to show you, I said, pulling out the photos and recordings. Frank and Jenny's expressions shifted from shock to horror as they realized what I had done. Steve, who had been oblivious to their betrayal, was devastated. He couldn't believe what he was hearing, couldn't understand how his father and wife had deceived him so completely. Jenny, once so composed, broke down in tears. She admitted to everything. The affair, the manipulation, the lies. Steve, furious and heartbroken demanded a divorce on the spot. Frank, too, was forced to face the consequences of his actions. But it wasn't enough. I wanted more. 
I wanted them to pay for what they had done to me, to my family. I filed for divorce and demanded alimony from Frank. Steve, who had been deceived by the woman he loved, also demanded compensation. The DNA test confirmed what I had suspected all along. The child Jenny was carrying was Frank's, not Steve's. Two years later, the dust has settled, but the scars remain. Steve and I are slowly rebuilding our relationship, though the trust between us has been shattered. Frank and Jenny, now living together, are trapped in a miserable existence of their own making. Jenny, who once dreamed of living in a beautiful home, is now isolated and alone, estranged from her family and friends. The house that she had coveted so much is now a prison, a constant reminder of the choices that led to her downfall. As for me, I've learned a valuable lesson. A home is more than just a building, it's a place where love and trust should reside. I may have lost the house, but I've gained something far more precious, freedom. Freedom from the lies, the deceit, and the pain that once consumed my life. And with that freedom, I've found the strength to move on, to build a new life, and to leave the past behind. But even as I move forward, I can't help but wonder, what would have happened if I hadn't discovered the truth? If I'd continued to live in ignorance, blind to the betrayal, happening right under my nose? Would I still be in that house, living a lie? Or would I have found the strength to leave on my own? I'll never know the answer to those questions, and perhaps it's better that way. The past is behind me, and all I can do now is look to the future. A future where I am in control of my own destiny, where no one can take from me what I have worked so hard to build. And so, as I close this chapter of my life, I do so with a sense of peace. The storm has passed, and though the damage was great, I have survived. I have come out the other side stronger, wiser, and ready to face whatever challenges may come my way. Because in the end, it's not the house that matters, but the person who lives in it. And I know now more than ever that I am strong enough to stand on my own, to build a new life and to create a new home, one where love, trust, and truth will always reign supreme.